Um, I'm Martin Murray, representing Kaufman College it, uh, and introducing uh, Matthew Gandhi as one of our keynote speakers. Um, Matthew, and it's a great pleasure actually to do this, Matthew and I have run into each other on various occasions over many years, but this is the first time I think we've actually been in the same place for this long day today, which has been quite um, interesting and quite productive. It's a really a great pleasure to welcome him here and for us to share our ideas and our thoughts with him and to have him share his um, ideas and thoughts with us. He's a professor of cultural and historical geography and a fellow of King's College at University of Cambridge. Uh, he formerly worked at the University College London, where he's also the founder and the uh, first director of the UCL Urban Laboratory from 2005 until 2011. I'm going to say a few things about Matthew's work. I'm not going to go through all his awards and, and, and uh, book titles and so forth, but just a few uh, general comments about, about his contribution to scholarship. Matthew is fascinated by by the hidden histories of places. The obscure, the seemingly mundane, and out of the, and out of the way uh, sites that often escape notice and attention. For Matthew, alien plants in Berlin, underground sewers in 19th century Paris, the concrete channels that replaced spontaneous nature in the LA River, um, Robert Moses and his fixation on bri bridges, and more, all offer a distinctive lens through which um, that Matthew uses to critically examine broader processes of space and power. Um, he has, in, in some of his books, he has a methodological approach, which I have actually um, made use of, um, which is writing essays that seem to be uh, disparate and disconnected. But writing these essays in such a way that he pieces them together in an overall mosaic, so these shorter stories that tell a wider, um, um, a wider narrative um, about social processes. It's a real, the, his, work, his works are, are like works of discovery. By reading through, you gradually come uh, to appreciate how pieces can all fit together uh, in a coherent whole. Um, his, and his book, Concrete and Clay, does this. Um, his, that book was cited close to a thousand times, um, which is um, quite astounding, actually, for an academic. Um, in the main, his work focuses on cities as reworked nature or second nature. Um, this approach stresses the organic nature of city building or urban metabolism, where the built environment is constantly under threat of ruination. Uh, he, um, he wrote and directed a film um, called um, Nat uh, Natura Urbana, uh, the Bracken um, of Berlin, which explores uh, the extraordinary variety of spontaneous vegetation that sprang up all over Berlin after World War II. And I suggest you can find it, um, 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 at least the, the trailer on the internet, and I suggest you see it. It's really a brilliant piece of, of a cinematography photography with a written and directed um, uh, approach from, from Matthew. The film takes an almost surreal journey of discovery, touching on the microecologies and the exotic landscape that emerged out of fallow ground. Matthew is interested in, it, such, a diver, uh, in, in such diverse ideas as unintentional landscapes, wastelands, cyborg urbanism, rust belt ecologies, biodiversity, moths, and I mean moths, the bugs, um, waste, environmental destruction, um, the engineering behind techno-modernity, uh, Puerto Rican communities in New York, and landscapes of despair. But mostly, Matthew seems attracted to, almost fixated on water. Water, water everywhere. Um, water in all its manifestations, both real and imagined, in uh, its power to build and to destroy, its polluting impacts, its smell, uh, and its power as a source of life. So I welcome uh, Matthew here tonight for us. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, th thanks, Martin. That was a, a very nice uh, introduction. And it's uh, really great to be here. It's been uh, such an, an interesting day, quite a long day, but very, very interesting. <laughs> um, so, in this talk, then, I want to reflect on aspects of urban nature. Uh, it draws in part on a large research project I have at the moment called Rethinking Urban Nature. And it also um, relates to uh, a book project that I'm, I'm currently um, writing. So I want to begin by mentioning a really interesting art exhibition that I read about called the uh, Brownfield Research Center uh, in Stoke-on-Trent, which is a, a deindustrializing city in the north of England. So I decided to go to this exhibition. It sounded very interesting. So I, I got the train up to Stoke-on-Trent. I went along to this exhibition, and it was arranged in an extremely interesting way. Uh, there was a variety of um, films, various artworks, but at the center of it was a a public research laboratory, a kind of public library uh, that included um, not only um, books, but various um, botanical specimens, maps, microscopes. Um, people involved in the exhibition were often around to chat to people. It was really an, an invitation for local people to interact with different scientific questions about marginal spaces, and in this case, brownfields or wastelands. And in fact, the, the whole inspiration for this um, exhibition was a wasteland located about 400 uh, meters away from the exhibition. And I hadn't actually realized as I walked past this site that this really was what the exhibition was all about. And it really made me um, reflect on how these uh, marginal spaces can be uh, a source of inspiration, both um, artistic and creative inspiration, but also sites of scientific um, curiosity as well. Now, the idea of an exhibition about different conceptualizations of nature in Stoke-on-Trent uh, in the north of England is interesting, because Stoke-on-Trent is, if you like, an axiomatic, deindustrialized city with, in fact, quite similar types of social and economic problems to, to Detroit. It's a city that has historically, through its concentration of heavy industry, potteries and so on, contributed very much to atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. So when we talk about the historical legacies of contemporary climate change, a city such as Stoke-on-Trent has played a very important role. But it also seems to me that it's in these dislocated communities with changing patterns of nature that new environmental discourses might also emerge. At a political level, Stoke-on-Trent is a city in a state of flux. It forms part of what was referred to last autumn as the red wall of center-left labor-held constituencies, many of which fell in this highly polarized British election in December. Um, two out of the three constituencies in Stoke-on-Trent fell to the Conservative Party for the first time in a very long time. And reflecting on this, it made me think that places like Stoke-on-Trent share some similarities with the political upheaval that has also affected some of the deindustrialized states in the USA, Michigan perhaps, in particular, Wisconsin, Massachusetts. There's some, some parallels here. And it also seems to me that the, the upsurge of this, in the UK sense, this um, xenophobic Brexit project, which many of you will have read about, forms part of an international pattern of polarization and rising levels of xenophobia and racism. And one of the questions for me is, 
in what way can new um, ecological or environmental discourses begin to frame alternative conceptualizations? What role can urban ecological discourse um, play in this? Now, when I think about my particular interest in these wastelands or marginal spaces, I think about my um, childhood in London and the primary school that I went to. And I remember that next to the school, there was a, a hole in a fence that led into a so-called bomb site, one of these marginal spaces uh, which were a relic from um, aerial bombardment in the last war. And I remember, um, as a child, looking forward to lunchtime, because then I could disappear, go through this fence, into this kind of magical world um, filled with um, flowers. Some typical flowers associated with these so-called bomb sites, um, uh, rose bay willow herb, known as fireweed, here in North America. Also, um, the buddleia bush originating from China with these um, fragrant um, honey-scented flowers that would attract um, clouds of butterflies. So for me then, this space, ostensibly empty space, which was brimming with life right next to, to my school, was a kind of magical garden. And in thinking about the presentation, it occurred to me that when we reflect on the, the history of gardens, the historical origins of a garden were a kind of um, oasis in an otherwise inhospitable or barren environment. So the sense of a protected space in terms of the historical origins of a, of a garden. Now, I also remember um, as, a, as a child that um, the site was designated for the construction of an office block. And I remember, aged around 10, I think, writing with sort of self-consciously neat handwriting my first letter of protest against the destruction of this um, site. But, of course, this, this pattern of change in urban ecological formations and the vulnerability of such sites to the speculative dynamics of space is really a, a constant um, theme. So, in my presentation today, then, I want to look at four questions, if you like, or themes. I want to begin by reflecting on the question, what is urban nature? What is, what is this thing that is so intriguing and fascinating? Secondly, I want to make a kind of historiographical sketch of some of the, the models and metaphors that have been used to understand urban nature. Thirdly, I want to make some comments about urban refugia and the specific role of cities in protecting or enhancing uh, biodiversity. And then finally, I want to pick up this thread of new natures and new or novel kinds of socio-ecological um, formations. So when we reflect on the, the notion of what urban nature might be, one possible entry point might be to differentiate between maybe three broad areas to begin with. One strand would be the notion of um, spontaneous socio-ecological assemblages, the nature that has simply arrived or changed in response to um, human environments. And um, as part of this larger research project I mentioned, um, I've been preparing a book on urban botany, and I was writing an essay about the urban transect, or the use of bot the botanical method of the transect in an urban uh, environment. And I started my essay with a, a, a poem by John Clare, the 19th century poet, which refers to a particular weed called Shepherd's Purse. And with just a few days to go before trying to assemble the materials for the publishers, I realized, realized that I needed a photo of Shepherd's Purse, which 
I thought was fairly common. And eventually, I managed to find it uh, growing outside my house in London. So that was really uh, convenient. I was beginning to give up any hope, and there it was. So I'm very happy that I managed to um, get my photo. But this sense of um, spontaneous socio-ecological assemblages has been a, a persistent form of fascination. And if we look at the recent history of urban ecology, um, the return of um, uh, uh, predators such as coyotes to North American cities has been a focus of very extensive interest. Um, in Europe, um, the return of the wolf to um, suburbs of major German cities has been a major talking point. And um, I also do research in India, and I was very interested to read about the, uh, the leopard population uh, in Mumbai. And it's maybe that's a bit too bright to see, but you may be able to pick out here a leopard sauntering along the back of a wall next to a housing estate. Um, the, the city of Mumbai, this vast uh, urban agglomeration, has one of the largest um, wildlife parks in an otherwise metropolitan area, the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. And there are about 40 leopards that live in and around the park and also move through the suburbs of Mumbai. And they have been a cause of concern or fear because there have been some human attacks. But their, their main uh, food source is stray dogs. And um, stray dogs are the major carrier of rabies, which causes um, considerable levels of illness and death uh, in Indian cities. And so there are some interesting discussions here about, if you like, the beneficial ecological coexistence of the leopard and human populations. So a lot of interesting discussions about how to coexist with major predators in uh, metropolitan um, areas. Now, a second manifestation, if you like, of urban nature, which I think is interesting, is what we might term uh, metropolitan nature. And this includes a variety of um, spaces and relations that have been um, domesticated or shaped or structured uh, by human effort. And I'm very interested, for example, in, in writing this book, I've begun to think about um, some of the infrastructure aspects of the modern city, not just water systems, which I've looked at in some detail, but also food production systems and abattoirs and how there is a, a geography of uh, meat, which you can also look at as a lens through which to analyze um, socioeconomic um, inequalities within the contemporary metropolis. And in thinking about this in relation to the North American city, um, Charles Bennett's extraordinary film, Killer of Sheep, for me, gives a very vibrant juxtaposition of the industrial labor of the abattoir and also the, the neighborhood in which the main protagonist's um, family live and the kids by day are playing in some of these empty lots. But in terms of the cinematography, we have this sense of different manifestations of urban nature, uh, the bird song, gentle swaying of trees uh, in these lots and backyards. So nature is very present in terms of different manifestations. And one particular facet of metropolitan nature has this presence in terms of the structuring of human livelihoods in the film. Now, when we think about the urban technosphere and some of the interactions with urban ecologies, um, another facet that I've been thinking about are the, um, the tubular ecologies of urban infrastructure um, and the, the, the level of uh, microorganisms. So you may have read something about um, uh, Legionnaire's disease, which is a, a bacterial disease that actually the bacteria thrive in hot water systems, air conditioning units, and so on. Um, first um, uh, discovered at a, at a conference in 1976 in Philadelphia. Um, 
But the interesting thing about this particular bacterium is it's adapted um, very, very well to artificial environments, these um, tubular um, ecologies. And sometimes I think when we talk about urban nature, we maybe don't look hard enough at some of the, the if you like, the biofilms, the microorganisms, um, urban soils, which are very um, rich but relatively unknown in terms of uh, biodiversity um, discourse. And then maybe a third facet of urban nature we could think of as the, um, the constitutive outside, um, the, the way in which areas or forms of nature interact with urban space in sometimes um, obscure or poorly analyzed ways. If we think about um, urban lighting and the current shift towards LED lighting, uh, the manufacture of LEDs is reliant on rare earths, and the mining of rare earths has profound uh, environmental uh, consequences. And this is a, an interesting illustration of one of the main um, operational landscapes, to use some of the terminology that Neil Brenner and others have used, uh, in relation to the extraction of rare earths. But this sense of the relationship between urban nature or the urban environment and distant places or processes is really important. And on the question of light, um, I was recently writing an essay um, actually about the environmental history of Arkansas. And um, I looked into the decline of the um, uh, bear oil factories in 19th century Arkansas. And I began to reflect on the fact that this vast population of bears had been almost completely um, eradicated during the 19th century. And in fact, one of the main uses of bear oil um, up until the early 19th century was street lighting, including cities like New Orleans. So some very profound and often violent interactions between nature and urban environments. Um, and light is just one, if you like, lens or entry point into some of these um, um, developments. But in a sense, though, if we do um, use the the, the neo lefevrian lens of planetary urbanization, I guess I would highlight a, a kind of a, um, a note of caution, perhaps, that certainly um, the rural, at least in terms of an ideological constellation, has not disappeared. And that I'm unconvinced about the argument that the entire world has become completely urbanized. I think there are uh, many different relations or modalities of landscape that we need to um, consider. So I want to make a few comments then about the, the models and metaphors that we might use to, to understand um, urban space and urban nature. And in terms of the history of urban planning and urban studies more generally, the Chicago School is an is a almost constant um, point of reference. And we know that the Chicago School was deeply flawed in terms of its um, very simplistic application of ecological metaphors taken from plant succession and things like that to understand urban space. Um, and the failure to really understand that capitalist urbanization was a historically produced set of relations, not a, a naturalized um, state of affairs. But the, the idea of applying um, ecological metaphors and models to urban space has not, of course, faded away. And the Chicago still remains quite influential, despite some of these um, conceptual um, shortcomings. And although a lot of this work was done in the 1920s and the 1930s, even in the 1970s, there are these books which are deeply steeped in the Chicago School tradition, but using much larger data sets. We find a strange segue into cybernetic urban ecological formations that is still doing this kind of meticulous uh, uh, data uh, mapping and application of these um, 
uh, metaphors. A second strand that emerges in the 1970s and is somewhat um, different is what I might refer to as the Brussels School, and particularly associated with Paul Duvigneau, the, uh, the Belgian tropical ecologist. And he tried to essentially apply the same, what we might term, trophic imaginary to urban space. And again, we see this mania for measurement. Every single thing had to be included to give a full sense of the urban metabolic um, process. And clearly, he was very anxious that he might have missed something. Uh, in one of his papers, he refers to the need to include um, aquariums in the overall um, calculation. So it's really, it, it's a sort of impossible task that nevertheless he tries to uh, engage with. Um, but I think in terms of the, the lasting contribution of this highly um, um, analytical approach, very much uh, empirical approach, is probably more to do with the spatial mapping um, of Brussels, and particularly the, um, the urban heat island effect, which he, he beautifully represents in terms of the phased timings that trees um, come into bud in spring. Um, and for me, these are really uh, works of art. I think they're uh, amazing uh, representations. Another um, school of thought which emerges in parallel, perhaps, and is currently very influential, uh, really hovers around what we might term the Vienna School of Industrial uh, Ecology and the uh, Baltimore School of Urban um, Ecology. And here we see really major figures in the field of urban ecology, um, Marina Alberti, John Martzlov, and others. And there's a really huge and growing body of literature which um, presents um, what is presented as a comprehensive urban ecological theory to understand um, cities and urban space. And so Alberti, for example, uh, describes cities as emergent phenomena. And there's certainly a, a real confidence that um, social and ecological processes can be unified under a single um, analytical um, approach. And this is also reflected in the uh, Baltimore ecosystem study, which re received a lot of research funding. I mean, it, it attracted a lot of attention and has produced um, a lot of work. But cities then presented as um, socio-ecological um, systems. And certainly the, the Baltimore school are quite explicit in terms of their intellectual debt to the earlier Chicago school. In a way, the only real point of um, difference is that the Chicago school was very ambivalent about cities, that there was a, an ideological ambivalence about the modern city itself, whereas with these uh, modern uh, iterations of this approach, we've lost that anti-urban um, element from the um, discourse. But when you look at um, some of the papers produced from this work, you find that they, they stumble over um, actual urban processes, such as redlining, we heard about this morning, in intricate detail. The, the socio-ecological model stumbles very badly um, over these um, real processes of um, uh, spatial disparity formation um, and the forms of um, racial capitalism that we heard about earlier today. So, highly data-driven then. Again, this focus on measurement. Again, a deep ambivalence about how we understand capitalist urbanization as a historical process. And also, I think, a kind of forced interdisciplinarity, which, when, when you look at it more closely, appears to be an, an additive multidisciplinarity, that you have um, more and more areas of expertise and data um, grouped together, and yet somehow something is missing at the core in terms of trying to understand the, the urban process. Now, another strand, which in some ways is separate but has intersected at certain points, is what perhaps I would call the, um, the Paris-Berlin um, School of Urban Ecology, 
And this is really very different. This, this really emerges from um, urban botany as, a, as an embodied practice of walking through cities and discovering urban spaces. And if we go back to the 17th century, for example, there are these intricate urban floras and descriptions of plants growing in and around cities, primarily listing plants of some uh, medicinal value, but also really delighting in the variety of plants that can be found. And something of this idea of botany, walking, and urban discovery is also represented uh, in the work of um, Paul Jovet, uh, the French uh, botanist, working particularly in Paris. And his early 20th century studies really delighted in the variety of urban plants to be found and the, the micro adaptations. He even came up, came up with particular um, technical terms to talk about the effects of feet and trampling and how this would make micro variations in plants that might be uh, encountered. Also, in the early decades of the 20th century, we can uncover some very obscure scientific articles to do with train lines and botany as well. So there's a, the first signs of a coming together of fascination with these um, artificial environments uh, and the type of plants that grew there. But it's really in the post-war era that this urban botany really picks up uh, momentum. And um, especially with the work of um, Herbert Zukop and his colleagues uh, in post-war Berlin. And these botanists became completely fascinated with the plants that grew on destroyed spaces, the, the Trümmerlandschaften, the rubble landscapes um, of the city. And they discovered uh, many plants, for example, from the Mediterranean that would thrive in warmer, stony environments and so on, um, including uh, Chenopodium botrys, uh, the sticky goosefoot, uh, which became a sort of light motif for these studies of bomb sites and was very, very common um, up until recently, but has declined massively. Um, Martin um, mentioned that um, I recently made a documentary about urban botany in Berlin, and the, 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 the screenplay I put together had, you know, must have Chenopodium botrys. We've got to have this in the film. And eventually, I managed to meet up with a very, very good uh, botanist uh, who we interviewed in the film, um, Birgit Zeitz, and we went to a car park, and she walked into this car park, and we found various things, and then she pointed it to it. She found it, uh, so which was just great. So we managed to include this um, symbolic um, plant uh, in the film. Now, the work of the urban botanists in Berlin uh, was interesting because it was, it was so detailed, so comprehensive, but they faced the fundamental problem that with the, the geopolitical division of the city, they could no longer visit many of their favorite sites in what was now East Berlin. Uh, so they became, if you like, confined to the island city of West Berlin, which became their self-contained botanical laboratory. And they produced these extraordinarily um, intricate maps. The, the light gray area is the terra incognita of the DDR, East Berlin. But then within the island city of West Berlin, they divided the whole city into these specific botanical zones based on various assemblages of plants, a specific typology. And through this, they, they tried to influence um, at land use planning. Um, and they had some limited success in trying to influ influence the land use planning process and take ecological science um, seriously to protect um, vulnerable um, sites. But what was especially significant, though, about this upsurge of um, urban botany uh, in West Berlin and these urban assemblages of plants is that it fundamentally destabilized um, plant sociology as a branch of ecology. It fundamentally destabilized some of these existing ideas about what a, a, a pristine cultural landscape might be in a German context because of this extremely interesting cosmopolitan mix of plants. So 
there was a, an ideological dimension to urban botany that gathered um, momentum in terms of valorizing um, urban uh, environments. But when we look back on this really vibrant um, phase of urban botany and urban, urban ecology, particularly focused around Berlin, there are, I think, certain um, uh, weaknesses or anomalies which I think are worth thinking about. One is that this upsurge of urban ecology and urban botany evolved very much within a positivist and empirical scientific idiom. That although their studies of cosmopolitan ecology had profound and very interesting um, ideological uh, implications for landscape interpretation, very few of these botanists really, if you like, carried the argument through. It was often left to others, geographers and sociologists, to pick up these um, interesting threads. Another curiosity was the question of scale and really where, where was the edge of the city in terms of urban ecology? We had, if you like, an artificial geopolitical construction, but there was some ambiguity about the, the scale of the urban. The, the other curiosity is that almost everybody associated with this work was focused on botany, and there are very few other, other people engaged with this scientific program. There was an expert on spiders at a later stage, somebody looking at bees, but fundamentally, it was very much focused on plants, which generated its own particular conceptualization um, of urban space. But this very, in some ways, um, esoteric um, scientific um, vision of the city did influence aspects of urban policy. And um, one of the most interesting outcomes of this was a, a nature park, the Sudgelender Park, um, from abandoned railway sidings. But what's really interesting is the, the way in which the urban ecologists and the botanists uh, became influential in terms of, for example, a new political party which formed in the late 70s, the alternative list, that drew together a series of questions, um, violence against women, opposition to major road building programs, um, anti-racism, and also the protection of some of these vulnerable urban sites with, with very high levels of biodiversity. And the, the Sudgelender Nature Park you can visit today, but it's actually a fragment of a very interesting um, scientific public policy discourse that actually managed to go all the way over many years of discussion into being a, a place of nature. And if you do visit the Sudgelender Nature Park, one of the curiosities is that it's, it has these wooden walkways um, it has a heavily didactic feel to it because some of the more vulnerable areas would actually be damaged by too many people. So it's a very, if you like, it's a very um, a, a delicate interplay between these um, scientific discourses and the attempt to foster some kind of um, quite sophisticated public culture in relation to botany and urban ecology. So I want to pick up this thread then of um, biodiversity and the question of um, endangerment in relation to um, urban space. And one of the first comments to make is that cities often have higher levels of biodiversity than the surrounding um, agricultural landscapes. And in many cases, there's evidence that levels of biodiversity are actually continuing to increase in terms of the range of species in metropolitan areas. However, as Zukop and others found in Berlin, it's not that easy to protect fragments of urban nature on the basis of high levels of biodiversity because these are not, if you like, classic cultural landscapes that can provoke those kind of political responses that will lead to um, strong forms of um, legislative uh, protection. But it's interesting that as biodiversity as a term has gained political salience since the early 1990s, particularly the Rio conference, that in the UK context, for example, there's now an obligation 
on every um, local authority, um, every unit of local government, to produce a, a biodiversity action plan. And um, Hackney is the borough in London where I live, and I was really delighted to be involved in some way with this huge project with lots of different people sending data and information to produce some kind of a plan. Of course, it's not a plan that's ever likely to be implemented, but it was very nice to be uh, involved in creating it. Um, thinking, though, about urban endangerment, this fantastic book by Tim Choi, Ecologies of Comparison uh, in Hong Kong. He's an, he's an anthropologist. And I think, for me, it's one of the most subtle uh, attempts to consider biodiversity and endangerment in the urban um, arena. And among the very interesting questions that Choi raises are the fact that biodiversity is, to a significant degree, um, um, a global scientific or policy discourse. It very much flows out of a hegemonic set of relationships between the production of scientific uh, knowledge and patterns of um, geopolitics. How does, in other words, how does a global conservation or scientific discourse, how does that play out in a local or post-colonial context such as Hong Kong? Um, how does this interface really work in terms of different forms of uh, knowledge or understanding about urban nature? Furthermore, um, Choi looks at particular situations uh, such as um, uh, court cases um, or, he or legal hearings where people try to present arguments in favor of the protection of nature. And he explores the, the choreography or enactment of expertise. He's interested in how um, certain voices carry weight in particular deliberative um, situations. And really reading uh, Choi's work, I'm really reminded of some of the really important um, insights from feminist epistemology, um, philosophers such as um, Christy Dotson and others, who really look at the precise scenarios in which certain people are able to speak and their knowledge or understanding is taken seriously. And when you're dealing with complex technical arenas such as biodiversity discourse, these kind of questions become extremely important. But in terms of the, the link, if you like, between science, endangerment, and public policy, one of the most important links is what are called red lists, which many of you will be familiar with, uh, when particular species or ecosystems are given a, a certain level of protection. Now, in terms of my recent work, I've become um, fascinated with um, um, Abney Park, which is an overgrown um, cemetery in North London. It's a really nice uh, research site. Um, I, I also like it because it's about 100 meters from where I live, so it's really, really convenient to do my, my work in. But um, it's a very interesting site because it's, it's not a conventional nature reserve in the sense of a in the British context, an ancient woodland or a chalk downland or something like that. It's, a, it's very much a, a hybrid ecosystem with different uh, interesting elements. But historically, it seems clear that before the creation of the cemetery in 1840, some of the surrounding agricultural land, hedgerows and trees and so on, were incorporated into the design of the cemetery. And in this cemetery in inner London, is an extremely interesting insect, uh, which I recently published a paper on. Um, the Latin name is um, Pacota personata, and it's not a bee. And my colleague, um, Russell Miller, was studying bees, and he had this photograph, and he was thinking, I cannot identify this bee. It's not in any of the books. It's actually a kind of fly. It's a bee mimic, and it's, um, it's red-listed, it's very rare in Sweden, Germany, other European countries. It had only been found uh, once before in London in about 1965, and yet here it was, um, unmistakable. It's such a clever uh, mimic um, that it makes a buzzing sound. It twitches its legs just like bees do when they're deciding where to get pollen and stuff. It's really remarkable. And of course, personata, the scientific name, is also um, uh, relevant. And this became very interesting to me. So we have 
one of the rarest flies in Europe in the middle of London. What can we do with this information? Will anybody be interested in this? Um, so I and other colleagues have actually been collecting lots of information about Abney Park on about thousands of species. We've got fungi experts, uh, moth experts, that's me by the way. We have uh, bird watchers, um, hymenopterists who study wasps. And we've got all of this information. We've, we've prepared these amazing reports. Um, we've sent them to this statutory body called Natural England, okay? And they have the power to designate sites as being ecologically important. It's called a, a site of special scientific interest. And if you get a triple SI, it confers a certain level of protection on this site. And this really came to a head, actually, because there were plans to build um, major luxury housing complexes right up against the edge of the cemetery, and some of the trees would have to be cut down. There were actually street protests and so on. And I rang up Natural England many times to say, look, this site is in danger. We've got all this data. Are you going to come and visit? Will you do anything? And in five years, I haven't managed to get a single site visit from Natural England to come and have a look at this um, site. And we've sent all the scientific data. And the problem is, in a way, to be fair to Natural England, is they don't have anybody who can understand what the data means. They're victims of austerity, like almost every other public agency. And so you have this very weird situation where expertise lies at the grassroots level. But what can we do with that in such a, a complicated um, situation? And in terms of sites such as um, Abney Park, the, the term urban refugia comes to mind. The idea of some sort of ecological refugium where species might be able to flourish or be protected um, over a long period of time. And it maybe links, uh, in, in one of the earlier presentations, um, um, we heard the term um, sanctuary city. And it occurs to me that there might be some interesting lines of discussion or commonality between the ecological refugium and the sanctuary city in the contemporary uh, political uh, moment. And actually, my final comment I have to say about this um, fly is that I've spent maybe six or seven years trying to see it myself. And I know exactly what time of year it comes out. I know exactly which tree it lives on. And um, a student visited from uh, Harvard GSD uh, and I said, OK, I'll, we can do a kind of walking interview and walk around Abney Park. And I arrived at the tree, and I said, well, this is the tree. Of course, you won't see it. And then there it was. So this is, I did get a, po a photo, actually, finally. So um, it's definitely there. Um, so the finally, then, in terms of new natures, I wanted to think through some of these different manifestations of new natures. One interesting manifestation is what's sometimes referred to as um, urban wilderness. These spaces that have grown on neglected or abandoned um, sites, sometimes over a very long uh, period of time. And an illustration of, uh, of, urban, of an urban wilderness site is the um, Teufelsberg in, in Berlin. And at first glance, this looks like a forest that has probably been there for centuries. There appears, superficially at least, to be a continuity with forests around the edge of the city. But the, the Teufelsberg site is actually a huge rubble mountain um, at the end of the last war, where the, de the debris from uh, aerial bombardment and war was gathered to create an artificial hill. And as you walk through this site, you'll notice that if you're interested in, in botany and things like that, that it's a kind of a, a slightly odd assemblage of plants. It's clearly not a forest that you might encounter on the urban fringe. And if you look on the ground, something that really caught my attention was this um, question of historical memory and stratigraphy in terms of um, broken pieces from wartime destruction that lying on the ground uh, amid um, um, other plants. So a sense then of these sites of urban wilderness 
and their relationship to memory, I think, is interesting in the sense of, does a site such as the Teufelsberg, does it reveal collective memory about the city or in a strange way occlude it through the growth of vegetation? Um, so interesting questions about the relationship between urban wilderness and public culture. And when we think about these heavily overgrown uh, spaces of urban wilderness, this poses interesting cultural questions that sometimes such sites are seen as a symbol of neglect or abandonment. And one of the interesting questions for me is, when is that subtle moment when a site that is um, feared or even despised, when, when does it become something different? When does it evolve a more complex uh, relationship with a particular place or local um, community? And in a broader context, clearly ecological discourse has shifted quite a lot in recent years. When we think about things like ecological infrastructure and so on, it's now recognized that these um, neglected or heavily overgrown sites or marginal sites actually do play quite a potentially significant role in, in protection perhaps from floods, uh, the uh, amelioration of the urban heat island effect, and uh, possibly also in terms of particulate air pollution and so on. So there's now quite a, a broad-based set of arguments about the ecological role of such sites. A second element of new nature, which I think is interesting to me, is that of um, vernacular ecologies that I mentioned a few minutes ago, a, a subtle tipping point when a marginal site uh, becomes appropriated as a kind of vernacular public space, um, a kind of urban commons that the lichenologist Oliver Gilbert uh, once um, wrote about. And there are, I think, very interesting examples of this, this moment of appropriation. So the Catalan artist, Lara Amalsegui, uh, with a series of photographs here to open a wasteland, you see the slightly blurred image of the child rushing through. There's a sense that the gate or the fence has, uh, has been opened and people are able to wander through this space, enter this space, discover this space. Another... Um, Example that is quite poignant for me is the um, Andrea Arnold's film Fish Tank, set on the edge of London. And there's a particular moment in this film where the family group park again by a fence where there's a, a small opening. They go through, and there's this tranquil interlude by um, a body of water, probably owned by a water company, but um, this space, this uh, sort of magical space of tranquility, this, this space that is appropriated um, for human um, use. And Andrea Arnold, by the way, very interesting film director in terms of the intersections between um, landscape and infrastructure. And then in terms of new natures, we have what you could refer to as um, cosmopolitan ecologies. Um, where the, if you like, the, the global mix of plants and animals within urban space is celebrated as a very distinctive a kind of urban culture that goes way beyond the narrow band of ecology um, as, a, as a biophysical science. And the whole question of cosmopolitan ecology is very interesting to me, and there's a lot that's yet to be fully uh, written up or reflected on the, the environmental scholar um, Julian Adjaman, uh, back in the 1980s, um, set up the, the Black Environment Network in the UK. And one of the things that was of particular interest to the, the Black Environment Network was the, the ideological connotations of often the violent removal of non-native plants um, from urban landscapes. So this, at a very early stage, uh, they were drawing attention to some extremely interesting questions about the politics of ecological uh, landscapes in the urban arena. And when we think about cosmopolitan um, ecologies, this analytical framework can work in different directions. This site, the Chausseestrasse in Berlin, there was a, uh, a site actually where the former wall 
uh, one stood that I studied for a number of years. And one of the interesting things about this site was that it had formed a kind of mimic steppe, dry grassland ecology. And so you had uh, interesting species, like there's a, a moth up here, Cuculia fraudatrix, which is interesting because it's moved west um, and it's now uh, quite frequent on some of these post-industrial sites uh, and empty spaces within the city. But in terms of the cosmopolitan ecology of a site such as this, it's interesting because when you go back to um, 1930s and look at some of the plant sociology literature that I briefly mentioned, um, uh, plants from um, Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union were were seen as not just an ecological threat, but symbols of an ideological threat as well. There was this explicit hostility towards these new ecological assemblages. So it's, in a way, it's quite ironic in the contemporary city that we have these new um, ecological um, formations. And in uh, London and a number of other European cities, um, parakeets, um, have really flourished and provoked a quite extensive debate about the place of parakeets within the urban bird fauna and whether they're, they're problematic or not. And they're, well, they're vegetarian. Uh, they're, they're quite, um, so, some people think they're quite aggressive at bird tables, not particularly. They might, um, there might be a bit of competi competition with woodpeckers for nesting sites occasionally, but really th there isn't much evidence that there's any particular issue. Um, but they're now a very interesting addition to the London bird fauna. And there's something of an urban myth surrounding the, the London parakeets because it's reputed that um, Jimi Hendrix released two in Carnaby Street in 1968, and this is the, the source of the parakeets. That may be true, but we think there may be other sources. But anyway, not wanting to spoil that nice story completely. Um, and in terms of different manifestations of new natures then, the question of these novel ecosystems, novel constellations within urban space has provoked very intense debate within the ecological literature. Some of you may be familiar with um, Emma Maris's book, Rambunctious Garden. Um, now, she's a science journalist who's written extensively for Nature and other journals, but she's really come forward with the argument is that um, ecologists and conservation biologists need to forget about protecting pristine landscapes. It's a, it's a hopeless task, and we need to fully embrace the full uh, diversity of ecological ecosystems, which has understandably provoked quite fierce responses from uh, branches of conservation uh, biology. And then the final example of, of new natures I wanted to um, reflect on uh, is that of the ecological simulacra, which of course very much relates to aspects of urban design. And this is where there's been a a self-conscious inclusion or encouragement of spontaneous nature within designed projects. So if you like, a complex interplay between design and non-design uh, manifested uh, in uh, new landscapes. And among the very interesting and prominent examples are Park and Gleisdreieck uh, in Berlin, again, um, an abandoned site of railway infrastructure, which has been converted into a very popular and successful um, urban park. And they've laid um, rubble out, stones, to encourage certain plants to grow. So they've, in, for, in parts of this new park, they try to in, they've tried to encourage the kind of vegetation that existed before it was made into a park with a particular kind of um, wasteland um, aesthetic, which is staged um, for, um, for visitors to the park. And interestingly, the, the designers of Park Am Gleis Dayak are former students of the research center set up by Herbert Zukop. So we have this very interesting intellectual design lineage that we can trace right back to the early studies of Berlin in the um, early 1950s. <clears throat> 
Um, Gilles Clermont has been mentioned a couple of times uh, during today's um, workshop, the French botanist and landscape designer, hort horticulturalist. And he's made very extensive use of these um, so-called fallow or unused spaces. And um, it's, it's interesting actually visiting some of his parks. I remember when I went to Park André Citroën the first time with a friend, and she said, nothing's happened here, nothing's going on, because it looks as if nothing's really happening, and yet there's quite a lot of thought has gone into um, these spaces. And one thing that Clément uses, for example, in um, Park Henri Matisse in Lille, is what you could describe as um, invisible signage where you have mowing regimes which simply cut a strip through a, an urban meadow as if to guide the walker or the sight line in, in a particular way. So subtle, subtle measures that indicate that some thought or care has gone into the aesthetic uh, experience uh, in front of you. Um, but certainly Clément has been a, a very interesting and influential figure in terms of bringing elements of spontaneous nature into landscape design. And also in the case of Park Henri Matisse, this concrete plinth up here is explicitly presented as a kind of ecological refugium, linking with this idea of urban refugia, uh, which I mentioned, the idea that it's a, a safe haven for, for urban uh, biodiversity. And then one other um, project to quickly mention, uh, Chartier Dalek's Architects, um, a new uh, school on the site of a former car factory, uh, which has a very complicated series um, of um, uh, botanical uh, roofs, uh, which are covered in plants and flowers that children can explore. Um, and it, when I put this slide together this morning, I, I, I thought to myself, a lot has changed since, in a sense, the moment that that I entered the site in the lunch hour to explore such a space. And now there's actually a school design that includes spaces of discovery and spontaneous nature as part of the overall uh, concept. So just a couple of comments to conclude, because I think I'm, my time is up. So. Um, when we think about urban, urban nature, and I've mentioned various ecological paradigms in the presentation, I think it's important to recognize that there is no consensus. And I think that sometimes in the literature, there's almost um, an assumption that if we all get together, we're going to agree about what urban nature is or what we should do in relation to urban, urban ecological questions, or environmental questions. There is no consensus. And I think when we look at some of the emerging critiques of the Anthropocene, it's extremely interesting to me now that this debate, in a way, has begun to shift away from a dominance of the geological sciences with a, with a much bigger contribution from the social sciences and the humanities, a lot more critical voices are entering this debate. So I think no consensus is a good thing, because I think there's a lot to be argued about. I, I think a second point I'd make and it relates perhaps, perhaps to some of the vernacular cultures of nature I touched on, is the way in which we have these very vibrant emerging cultures of urban nature, that um, there's evidence that there's never been more interest in nature in metropolitan areas. Almost every city in the world has an ornithological um, society. Um, in Chennai, in southern India, where I've been doing research, uh, there's a really vibrant um, community of ornithologists and bird watchers. Um, there's also um, a very vibrant um, Tamil public sphere in relation to environmental questions. Uh, Rachel Carson's book has been recently translated into Tamil. There are environmental book fairs. There's a lot of discussion going on. And I think sometimes, in a sense, within the, the Anglo-American intellectual sphere, we may overlook these really interesting debates that are, that are going on um, elsewhere, particularly within the um, global south. Um, a third broad, broad point I would make, which certainly links with some of the other presentations, is the, the danger of ecological discourse serving as an excuse for the, the naturalization of capitalist urbanization. 
that we need to unpick the historical and ideological relationships between nature and the urban process. And then the final point, really, is what I would see as the kind of urban paradox, that on the one hand, we know that cities, both now and historically, have been um, drivers or even markers of the so-called great acceleration and new patterns of resource use at a global scale. Cities form part of this, this pattern. But at the same time, there's something special about cities in terms of the way they can serve as, a, as an experimental arena or a catalyst for far-reaching uh, cultural and political change. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. So in the time we have remaining, we'll take some questions. But what I wanted to say first was to thank Matthew, of course, uh, but to say there's, we're going to have a reception downstairs uh, where there's apparently food and drink uh, for all of us, and everyone is invited uh, to share that with us. Um, but I wanted to start, before I toss this at someone, um, with my own question. Like, what, how do you deal with, or what do you think about, um, like, what, for lack of a better term, alien plants that, that sort of invade spaces and drive out all the other, um, like, uh, like, like grasses that would basically push out everything else? How do you deal with with that with re and, 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 and reconcile that with your idea of spontaneity. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I think, I think that's a very, can, if I stand here, can you still hear me? I've got these all different microphones, okay. Um, I think that's a, a really important and interesting question. I mean, if you look at the scientific literature, there are, and you look at the, the hundreds of um, adventive or uh, neophyte species within urban ecosystems, actually very few, are, are, a, are a cause of ecological concern. The difficulty is um, where, if you like, a, a more nuanced, scientifically grounded discourse about managing ecosystems segues into some of these um, cultural tropes of um, uh, narrowly defined cultural landscapes or xenophobic uh, tropes in relation to conservation ecology. Um, so it's a very complicated and delicate terrain, I think, this. Uh, the, the question that, that you raise. Yeah. Thank you very much for a great talk, Matthew. I had a question for you about um, the, how you see, and does it matter in the way you're looking at things, the, the, the value in the authenticity of the spontaneous? Like, does, at the, at the end, you've alluded to a couple of examples. And I'm curious about, like, um, if the landscape, if the urban landscape were consisting of this particular multitude of species in some manner, uh, and it had accidentally emerged, um, would, would you read it, uh, would you value it in terms of the framework of values that is embedded within your thinking equally to a similar ecosystem which had arrived by other means? And so, and, and, and to what extent does the curation or the designing of a thing that portends to be spontaneous matter in the way you apprehend it? And I'm thinking about one example in particular, Toronto 2000, uh, which is that the Leslie Street Spit is an artificial archipelago produced of redeposited residue from the destruction of parts of the city by the US Army Corps of Engineers, which is then left to become verdant and sedimentation and things happen. It becomes this kind of really interesting version of the wilderness of which you speak, uh, and of course, rare species come there. Mm -hmm. And in 2000, the Shumi Downsview competition entry for the urban park proposes to reproduce aspects of that landscape as a kind of intentional operation. Um, do, when, if you were reading such things, does, is there a there there? Does it matter how they arrive? I mean, I, I think the, if like the botanical eye in relation to urban space, I think leads to a certain delight in the accidental discovery, the, you know, the, the railway embankment with dozens of unexpected plants. And there's something very special about the non-designed, spontaneous ecological formations. As I've suggested, there are, 
some quite sophisticated designers who pick up on not just the species but the process. So Clement is interested in certain biennial plants that produce an unexpected kind of garden formation. But I think there's another twist here, which I think is to do with the, the relationship between um, um, ecological understanding of temporality and public culture. And sometimes you get a conflictual situation where people imagine that this you know, vibrant space of flowers will remain the same forever, that it's, it's, a, it's a temporary moment in a complex set of changes. And we see this manifest actually in another example in Berlin, the Tempelhof um, airfield, uh, which is this vast space uh, with, with very interesting ecological assemblages. But sometimes discourse has become quite polarized between people who um, demand that it be left alone uh, in the belief that it will stay the same, but actually in 10 or 15 years, it would be a sort of a forest effectively or moving in that direction. And then of course, the, the efforts to intervene. So I think this sense of time and ecology is a really complicated facet to this discussion. Thank you, Matthew, that's fascinating. Um, I have a, let me po point to kind of extreme ways to look at the relationship between nature and the city, and then wondering after you've spent all these time in these urban gardens or wildernesses, if you've changed your mind about it. I guess one way is to really have a tidy, uh, uh, cities manufactured and designed and the wilderness is out there, and we have a tidy dichotomy between city and nature. And then the urban political ecologists come along and they warn us that, uh, in fact, there is no difference between nature and the city, and that's a false dichotomy. It kind of reminds me of the planetary urbanists, <laughs> and I think I'm uneasy with both argu arguments that there's no difference between the city and the rest of the planet. Um, and, and I can see the appeal of the urban political ecology, but, but it seems like uh, it, it's kind of conflating or trying to force nature and, and the human to be the same when in fact we still sense that there is something different. We, we do intuitively know when we cross some boundary from the city to the countryside or even from the city into the wilderness. So I, I guess my, and so maybe there are limits of the kind of social construction of nature uh, belief. So, after you've spent all this time, have you changed your mind about what the boundary is between the city and the countryside? I think that um, I, I don't think that I don't take the sort of total urbanization thesis as a starting point. I think that um, the historian Chris Otter's notion of the technosphere is much more um, compelling in terms of the kind of specific kind of socio-ecological and technical um, entanglements and so on. But in terms of my own feeling about these questions, I think that one thing is that through doing this research, my knowledge of botany has developed a lot in the last five or six years, and that's changed the way I look at urban landscapes, and that um, botany, for me, is a way of reading the landscape, any landscape, actually, um, and it does change the way you, you, you look at things. Um, and it also makes me question some of the sort of generic urbanism literature, where there's, lack, there's a lack of specificity about what the real um, aesthetic or ecological intentions are, um, I think. So, so that, would, that would be another, another facet um, as well. Oh, sorry, I wanted to, sorry, um, another comment that you picked up on. You, you mentioned urban political ecology. Mm -hmm. And um, which is a field that I've thought about quite a lot. I mean, I think that um, one of the problems with urban political ecology, which hasn't been reflected on much, is there's actually very little ecology in urban political <laughs> ecology. Um, because um, ecology, ecology is a, is a fast-moving field of many moving parts. And I don't get that sense that this is really a synthesis between very interesting neo-Marxian perspectives on capital's um, circulation in space, and at the same time, an appreciation of some of the developments in, in ecological science. And it occurs to me there are certain research questions which haven't really been adequately addressed yet. For example, to do with um, urban epidemiology, uh, the Zika virus is almost asking for a kind of revivified urban political ecology perspective that takes the science um, seriously. 
Yeah. So when Mona and Maria are rethinking the urban design curriculum, would you recommend that all urban designers take a botany course? Yes. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm sure you get this question all the time, but uh, I can't resist asking, uh, in terms of your uh, design philosophy, uh, what do you think of the High Line? I don't like it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> any, well, any reasons? Or, uh, um, I mean, I love it, I should say. But, oh, okay. Uh, a couple of, well, I, I think that it seems to me something of a contrivance, and it worries me that I think, maybe you'll correct me, I think it's the most expensive public space per square, square meter created in the world. And, and one of the first things I noticed on, on going up one of those uh, entry points was this enormous list of rules and regulations. And it, it, I mean, to me, really, as a neo-Marxian, really, botanist or something like that, it just seems to be part of this surveillance state gone mad with sort of aesthetic planting scheme. So I, I am not a big fan of it. But I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, hold on. Here you go. Oh, oh, yeah. um, I, I wondered if you wanted to say something about it in relationship to the dry meadows at Gleistria. Yes, I mean, although I really like Park and Gleistria, it's not without its own um, problems and contradictions. One of the problems with Park and Gleistria in Berlin is that, in a way, it's, it's brilliantly protected elements of this particular ecology associated with abandoned railway lands, but it's less good at protecting the local neighborhoods that it was intended to serve. Because now, there's a kind of canyoning effect with the sort of speculative developments around the park. So it's become, it looks to my eye, a little bit like the edge of Central Park even now, some elements of Park Amgleistriak. So in a way, it's almost easier to protect the ecological dynamics than the social dynamics of the place. And in, and in Berlin as a city, those of you who know the city, the big issue right now is escalating rent in a city where something like 90% of people rent. Even a small increase in rent has a profound effect across the entire city. More? Yes. Thank you for this wonderful lecture. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your work as a filmmaker and how that influences your work as a scholar, if there's an intersection or how they bleed into each other. Okay. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've written about cinema for quite a long time. I have an interest in um, uh, film theory and um, particularly cinematic landscapes and, and questions like that. But I've also become interested in using film as a, as a methodological tool. And I think that it presents possibilities to present um, quite complex uh, narrative structures and also sometimes pose more questions than answers in certain ways. It's, um, um, and it's also, I think, a, a poss it, it presents a possibility, I think, to step outside of the academy and it can force you to think about the way you use um, evidence or different empirical materials. And the other thing that strikes me about um, uh, filmmaking is that, in, in a sense, there's no such thing as a documentary a, or a pure documentary form, that you have a spectrum of um, representational uh, possibilities. And you do become aware that even subtle um, changes in terms of um, sound or editing can have quite a profound effect. So with the, the film about Detroit this morning, I really liked this very sparse um, piano music that was used occasionally. It, it gave a very, to me at least as a viewer, a very kind of reflective, contemplative tone uh, or, or mood as, as you move between sometimes quite complicated uh, questions or developments. So uh, yes. I think, I think it's certainly uh, worth, worth doing. Just, I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts on natural bur burial? On, on what, sorry? Natural burial. What, do you want to, can you just tell me a little bit more about what your question is? I guess in the West, um, 
there are a lot of chemicals that are pumped into dead bodies to yeah. prevent decomposition and natural burial is about just disintegrating into the eco ecosystem? Well, um, this isn't really a direct answer to your question, but um, in one of the chapters in the book I'm writing is called um, Forensic Ecologies, where I, I engage quite a lot with the work of Isle Weitzman and forensic architecture. And one of the things that I've become interested in is forensic entomology and uh, the way in which the collection of information about uh, decomposing bodies has proved incredibly important for crime scenes. But I wanted to develop an analogy about the collection of data about um, the larger crime scene of global environmental destruction and the role of um, indicator organisms uh, in terms of different processes of environmental uh, degradation. So in a, in a slightly broader sense, I've thought about one or two of these um, questions. And of course, I do do research in, in graveyards as well. Um, but I, I couldn't really get to the core of your very specific question, I'm afraid. So, um. <laughs> um, thank you. I'm wondering if you could explain what led to your development of interest in moths. And did you find anything uh, um, based on your research and studies? Well, um, although I'm a geographer, I sort of uh, have a kind of double life as an entomologist in some ways. And um, I think that one of the things that's really fascinating me about the insect world, and I have written stuff about um, uh, moths and so on, is that um, I think aesthetically, I think they're extraordinary. Um, I showed you this uh, Pacota personata, this hoverfly that resembles a bumblebee, uh, the forms of mimicry, so-called Batesian mimicry, um, there are um, a lot of uh, moths that resemble wasps, and it's just incredible, the level of uh, mimicry, so on that level. Also, I'm interested in insects as um, indicator species for biodiversity decline, and now there's a lot of very interesting research um, drawing together uh, data, not just on bees, which has been extensively discussed, uh, but other sources of biodiversity. From, so from all angles, and the fact that I just have a natural curiosity in the area, I would say, so... Thank you. Note about malls. We'll all uh, retreat uh, to the reception downstairs. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>